This video was sponsored by Card Kingdom. You can visit their store by using my referral link in the description below. Hi everyone, I'm Nitsa Hone, and it's Saturday, and that means it's time for Nitsa Notes, my weekly vlog series where I talk about limited magic. We are still in the early stages of the Brothers War. I'm like 12 drafts in. It's been a pretty good start, one of my better starts to any format. My win percentage is around 70%, and you know, that'll come back down to earth at some point, but it's been a nice start to the format. But I still have like a relatively small sample size, and I didn't want to just yet start talking about some cards that I think I was wrong about, you know, that I would think we should be evaluating a little differently than I thought. And instead, I want to look at the format a little more broadly. I feel like I've done enough drafts to have five sort of big takeaways at this point about the format. So the first of these takeaways is that the fixing in the format is not good. I mean, that's how it looked in the set review. Um, there is not a common cycle of lands for fixing that we have in a lot of formats. You know, we just came from Dominaria United, where fixing was incredibly good. So it's a pretty big difference to go from that to this, where... You're mostly reliant on Evolving Wilds and some cards from the Retro Frame Artifacts if you're actually going to get some fixing. You know, there are a few other pieces of fixing out there, like the 1 mana 1-1 one, one, that taps itself and then an artifact or a creature to add 1 mana of any color. And then there's the 2 mana artifact that replaces itself that can filter mana for 2. These are like kind of okay, but there's still not enough for you to feel like in this format that there's good fixing. If you get lucky with the Retro Frame Artifacts, I mean, you can get there. Uh, in particular, Burnished Heart is like the best piece of fixing in the entire format, but it's an uncommon, I mean, I guess uncommon is the lowest rarity in the Retro Frame Artifacts, but it's rarer than your typical uncommon is because it's from the Retro Frame Artifacts, so you can't really rely on it. So the point here is you really do not ever want to play any sort of legitimate three-color deck in the format barring, you know, getting lined up with some good fixing out of luck. Mostly, I'd say about 90% of the time you're playing two colors in this format, and that other 10%, you're just splashing one other powerful card. You don't really want to go much deeper than that, and that can be a hard transition, especially if you just started playing in Dominaria United, where you can play whatever you want almost because the mana was so good. But this is actually a more typical limited format where there's just not that good of fixing around. And this format actually is even worse about it than most. And this is largely because green has all of its fixing or has all of its ramp focused in on power stones mostly. So there aren't that many green cards that let you search up a basic land. You know, there's an uncommon that can do it, bushwhack. But, you know, usually there's a little more than that around and we just don't have it in this set because the Power Stones is what green is leaning into in terms of ramp, and it's not looking to be searching up a basic land and putting it into play or things like that. So that's the first big takeaway. This is mostly a two-color set, like most limited formats, except, again, I think even more limited than most limited formats on the fixing. The other sort of broad takeaway, and I guess this is the closest I'm going to get to like really zeroing in on some cards that are better than I thought or whatever, and that is that the common cycle of self-millers are all good. You know, I give all of these solid grades or better, and you know, for this cycle I'm referring to uh, things like the mole that's a 4-mana 3-4, mills 3 cards, or well, it's a 4-mana 2-3, mill 3 cards when it enters, and if you mill a creature, you can choose to return it to your hand. If you do, you get it in your hand, and if you don't, it becomes a 3-4. Um, you know, I liked this whole cycle, but I think I really underrated how frequently, especially the mole, uh, can grant you a 2-for-1. I think they're all good. I mean, the, the white one, black one, green one, those three grant you a 2-for-1 a massive percentage of the time because they all let you hit something that you have a lot of in your deck. The other two are a little less good because your deck has to be more of a specific composition. You know, the red one hits artifacts and the blue one hits non-creature spells. Those two are a little harder to make work, but all five of them end up granting you a two-for-one a huge chunk of the time. And then the black one and the green one also give you a bunch of additional value because you want to load your graveyard anyway. And that's true to some extent of the white one as well because black white's kind of into the graveyard but black and green are both graveyard colors in this format and milling yourself sets up a whole bunch of other stuff you're trying to do already so this whole common cycle of self millers uh it sort of feels like the backbone of the format 
And sort of like the cycle of uh, cost reduction, big cost reduction creatures from Dominaria United did in the sense that they all kind of tell you a type of card that these colors are sort of interested in to some extent. And they're all pretty nice cards. I mean, I don't think I love the idea of first picking all of them, but I feel like the mole and the uh, the white one, the three mana one, one flyer, those two are okay to first pick, I feel like. Um, the rest may be a little less so, but they're all nice. They've all been impressive, you know, better than I expected, and they're cards you see all the time. So don't underrate them. I mean, you know, you're going to play a lot of copies of these in most of your decks. Milling yourself is more upside than downside uh, in general in Limited. I know sometimes people see it as a negative, especially if you're a newer player, um, and the idea that you're going to mill yourself out sooner seems like a problem. And like, yeah, that can be a problem in the extreme late game, but very few games of Limited reach that point. So it doesn't really matter. You're mostly just getting upside. You're giving yourself a pretty high chance of drawing an extra card with these. And if you don't, they're all kind of reasonable creatures. I mean, you certainly don't feel good about any of them as creatures if you whiff, but they're all passable. And the fact that they give you this big chance and some graveyard synergy, this big two for one chance and graveyard synergy makes them all quite nice. Third early takeaway is that Power Stone Ramp is very real. You know, this is something I was hoping for going into the format. I felt like it would be the case because, you know, there's just enough ways to make power stones that you can you can really ramp into some silly stuff. Um, you know, one of my, I think it was the first draft video on this channel, uh, I actually pulled stuff off with Phyrexian Portal and Helm of the Host, and I just had like absurd amounts of mana. That's something I've seen continue. Like all of these big mana artifacts um, are all very real, especially the ones that have prototype. Like they're, they are really well-designed cards for the format. Um, because, you know, you can play a 5-mana 3-5 with Reach uh, early, if that's what you need, and sometimes you do, or you can hold on to it and play it as a huge 10-10 later in the game. And, you know, having these cards capable of doing both of these things has made these sorts of decks a lot more resilient, because you have one card that can function in both ways, um, you know, both as an earlier game play and as sort of a win condition in the later game. So, yeah, the ramp decks are very real, um, and yeah, I'm happy to say that that's the case. Um, there just aren't very many formats where you can be like, yeah, you know what? I'm going to play a nine mana artifact like Phyrexian Portal, uh, or Portal 2 Phyrexia. Phyrexian Portal is an older card. Portal 2 Phyrexia and things like that. But this is one of them. And, uh, that's a lot of fun. It, it adds a different sort of, uh, feeling to the format that you're like, yeah, I can cast nine and 10 mana things. Let's do it. On the sort of flip side of that, aggro decks are real too. Um, the one deck that I've gone 7-0 and with so far was a black-red aggro deck, had a low curve, had lots of sacrifice synergy, um, you know, I mostly just curved out and, and, you know, did a bunch of damage, sacrificed some stuff to finish my opponent off for various payoffs, um, but I've also seen, I haven't actually drafted it myself yet, but I've been run over <laughs> by my fair share of red-white aggro decks in the format, um, you know, they have a lot of, um, unearth in them and so yeah you, you know they curve out early attack you for a bunch and normally you're like okay i traded off with their things i'm going to be all right but in this format they sort of have this second wind where they can unearth stuff and finish you off and it's pretty effective so aggro decks are real ramp decks are real so far i feel like you know it's early but i do feel like all 10 color pair archetypes are fairly viable but in some ways, I do feel like Power Stone Ramp and these sort of streamlined aggro decks are the best decks in the format right now. It's too early to really feel entirely secure in saying that, but that is sort of how I see things right now, you know, 12 drafts in. And in some ways, this creates a similar tension to what we saw in Dominaria United, even though the two sets are very different from each other in that there are these really fast decks that can kill you quickly, but then there's these ramp decks that can, you know, if they manage to resolve their seven mana, six, five golem that gains them, or yeah, that gains them six life, you know, it's hard for the aggro deck to win. But if you can kill them before they get there, you probably beat them. And I do like that kind of tension to some extent. And then the last thing, and I don't think it's a good thing, and I'm hoping that this is something that goes away a little bit as uh, I play the format more. But right now, at least, right now, I feel like the format's a little bomb heavy. 
I feel like, I mean, maybe I've just been incredibly lucky. It's part of the reason my win percentage is so high. But all of my best decks have had, like, insane bombs in them. I've been beaten a lot by insane bombs. Um, and there are, you know, it feels like a higher concentration, partly as a result of the Retro Frame Artifacts introducing a couple of really absurd cards in Worm Coil Engine and Helm of the Host. Cards that I've seen more than my fair share of played against me, uh, mostly. I did get Helm of the Host once. Uh, so maybe I've just been unlucky. But there are a lot of other cards that are just so hard to beat. And, you know, they're cards I gave bomb grades to in the set review, but it just sees, seems like a lot of games are being determined by them. Um, things like Transmigrant Crown is just, it feels unbeatable because you put it on a creature and, you know, your opponent has to trade with it or take a bunch of damage. And if they trade with it, you get a two for one. And if they take the damage, well, you're happy with that too. Um you know, the mythic rare prototypers are all pretty absurd. Um, so, you know, I'm hoping this is something that, that balances out um, because it's not usually a great thing for a format to have a lot of bombs. But right now, that's how I feel like it is. Um, I do think everything else about the format seems healthy. There seems to be good color balance. Um, all the decks seem viable. That stuff is good. So if the only problem is there's too many bombs, I mean, it's not the end of the world. But... Uh, Ideally, that ends up not being the case in the long run. So those are my five early takeaways from the format. Um, first, uh, there's not very good fixing. Don't try to play more than two colors very often. The common cycle of self-millers is very good. Power Stone Ramp is very real. Aggro decks are very real. And the format is bomb heavy. At least that's how I feel right now. So those are those five early takeaways. Now let's do a crack a pack here at the end of the video, as usual, I'll open a pack. I'll, sh well, I'll show you a pack on the screen. Um, we will talk about all the cards in the pack. I'll tell you how I feel about each of them and whether I would first pick them or where I would pick them. Uh, and then we'll decide what I would take with the first pick in that particular pack. All right, here's our pack. Our retro frame artifact is Wall of Lost Dreams or Well of Lost Dreams. Pretty sure that was in last week's crack a pack too, and we ended up kind of considering taking it because our pack was kind of underwhelming. And it is a powerful build around. There's no life gain deck in the format, so you know you don't have any other payoffs to play alongside it. But you end up with enough cards with life gain stuff attached to them, some of it repeatable, that you can certainly play the well in the right deck. I don't really love the idea of first picking it, but it is powerful. Uh, next up, it's Falaji Chain Dancer. This card has been kind of underwhelming overall, I think. I mean, I didn't think it was going to be great, but I haven't really felt um, concerned when my opponent played it, and I haven't felt good when I played it, and that's usually not a great sign. It's not unplayable or anything, but certainly not something you first pick. It just, you know, there are a lot of boards that it just can't attack through, even with its double strike ability. Uh, Deadly Repost is next. This is a solid removal spell, especially if you aren't an aggro deck. It kills a lot of stuff, gains you life at the same time, things you love to do uh, against aggro decks, but it's not premium removal because of how conditional it is, and because, you know, if a removal spell is really only good in one kind of deck, it's definitely not premium, uh, not something you want to first pick especially. Ambush Paratroopers next. This has been nice. If anything, it may be a little better than I expected. You know, it has the useful creature type, its buff effect has really mattered, and it can help close games out in the air. Um... Right now, I guess it's what we would first pick. Uh, I hope it's not what we first pick. But right now, that's probably where I am. I like it a little more than the Riposte. Uh, Thraxo Demon is next. You know, this card's solid. It lines up well uh, in a couple of different decks. I mean, its ability is expensive, even with Power Stones. But, you know, in the Black-Red Sacrifice deck, it can generate some value. And in the Blue-Black Draw 2 deck, it can generate some value, too. And right now, that might be my favorite deck in the format, the, the Draw 2 deck. There's just a lot of fun stuff you can do with it. Um, but Thraxo Demon isn't exactly the enabler you're hoping for, but he is fine. Uh, Mishra's Onslaught, you know, this is okay if you're, especially if you're red-white, uh, helps you go wide and gives you a payoff for going wide. Not especially good at either, but having like one of these in your red-white aggro decks seems fine. Next up, it's Epic Confrontation. This is going to become our first pick. This is a great removal spell. Was last time we saw it, and it is here. Plus and plus two just makes so many creatures more effective at successfully fighting an opponent's creature and surviving. And there are frequently times where using this allows you to kill your opponent's only relevant blocker, and then you can suddenly just swing out and stuff like that. Um, you know, this format has a decent number of large creatures that are extra good with it too. It's premium removal. You know, you do have to find the right window for it. 
Um, you can't just cast it when your opponent has a bunch of mana up and cards in their hand or you get blown out. And that hurts it a little, but right now I think it is what I would first pick. Next up, it's Gixian Infiltrator. This has been a fine, but not anything special uh, payoff for the black red deck, especially, um, you know, definitely don't want to first pick it. It's the kind of card you pick up actually near the end of a pack. And if you end up with enough sacrifice synergy, you play it. But a lot of the time you don't. Next up, it's Warlords Elite. This has maybe been slightly better than I expected, but it's still very awkward. Like, I, there are so many times, you know, I've only played it once so far, and the time I did, you know, it had its moments where it was like, okay, I actually got a good deal there. But it had just as many moments where it was like, okay, I basically paid five mana for this, or okay, I flat out can't cast this because my opponent has tampered with my board enough. Um, and that's not so good. So definitely not something I'm going to first pick. Still on Confrontation. Air Marshal's next. This is a solid two drop, especially if you're a soldier deck. Um, but we're still on Epic Confrontation. Now we move into Uncommons. Reconstructed Thopter is up next. Um, you know, this is fine. Um, you know, this pack has been... Last week our pack was kind of underwhelming. I think this one is too. Uh, the Thopter is something you would play in virtually every deck in the format. I guess... If you are like a ramp deck, maybe you're not that into it, but you know, it's nothing amazing, but you know, if you're in the green white deck, it gives you two artifacts entering the battlefield triggers. If you're in the black red deck, it gives you a way to, uh, you know, you can sacrifice it twice. Um, if you're in the red white aggro deck, it's a reasonable flyer that can come back and help close out the game. So it's the kind of card that slots into a lot of decks, but it's also not the kind of card that you are eager for in any of those decks either. So, you know, I'm still on Epic Confrontation here. Uh, Calamity's Wake, this is unplayable and limited. Uh, you know, if you play against someone who has an insane amount of unearth, it's a sideboard card at best, but, you know, you don't want to play it in limited. Its effects don't matter in 99% of games, uh, so certainly not what you first pick. Next up, it's No One Left Behind. You know, this one's interesting. Um, it's a card I was pretty high on going into the format, and I still don't have a fully formed opinion on it because somehow or another, I haven't played with it or against it yet. Um, you know, I'm only 12 drafts in, so and it's an uncommon, so not crazy. Um, you know, I feel like it has some serious um, potential because of the fact that it reanimates small things really efficiently and then still has this big upside of reanimating big crazy things, which there are plenty of in the format. And, you know, early in the format, I often like to take cards I haven't played with that I think have potential just so I can find out. And I think I would take it here. Um, you know, you do need the right deck, you know, black green or, or black white, ideally, to make it work. But I do want to play the card. I mean, if I was being really responsible, I have a feeling Epic Confrontation is still what we would take out of this pack. But No One Left Behind is something I really want to try. Uh, if you have tried it, you know, let me know in the comments. I uh, just haven't seen much of it so far, but I do think it's a pretty real card. Our rare is pretty good. Uh, it's Argoth Sanctum of Nature. So, you know, this melds with Titania. Not going to come up very often in Limited, but it is a good land. You know, it's not going to enter untapped very often either, but the upside you get is real because you can crank out bear tokens and load your graveyard, which green cares about in the format. You know, really sets up all your graveyard payoffs, sets up your no one left behind and stuff like that. I don't think... You know, I think it's about as good, basically, as, like, Epic Confrontation. I have them on very similar tiers, I guess, in terms of where I would take them. I think Argoth definitely has more upside. And I guess in the end, you know, again, I think I would probably still take No One Left Behind in this pack. Uh, but just because I want to play with it. But uh, I think I would take Argoth in the end here, I guess. I mean, the ability to, to load your graveyard really matters in green. And these bear tokens you get are great. You know, this is a repeatable way to mill yourself, and you do have to be a little more careful with that, but the good news is you can just stop making bear tokens once you reach that point. It's not something that keeps happening or anything. Um, so, yeah, I think we take Argoth in the end here. Overall, a pretty underwhelming pack. Um, you know, Argoth, no one left behind in Epic Confrontation, and then Well of Lost Dreams. I mean, it has big upside, but it takes some work. Like, those are the, those are the cards that I would feel okay about first picking. Everything else in the pack... Not so much. Um, so pretty interesting that this pack, it's maybe not as weak as last week's was, because last week we didn't even have like a premium removal common anywhere like we do in this pack. So, yep, Argoth, Sanctum of Nature in the end here. 
that'll do it for this week's Needs and Notes. I'll be back next weekend, of course. And I think next weekend I'll have had enough drafts under my belt that I can take a crack at telling you, you know, 10 cards I was just wrong about in the set review. Uh, so we'll dive into that next time. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like it and share it so that others can enjoy it too. If you want to make sure you catch future videos, don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications. If you want to catch up on past editions of Needs and Notes or watch my set review for The Brothers War, you should see those playlists shortly. Thanks for watching.